some skills. Welcome to New Life Alliance Church, whether you're here or whether you're looking at home. We thank you for being here. We love you guys. And we just want to welcome you and we want to start praising and worshiping our Lord. We want our Lord to be glorified this morning, don't we? Amen. Is anybody else happy that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Woo! Can I give an amen? amen. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. If you stand with us, we're going to get started. This is Robbie, also you can clap.
Father, we thank you for this place. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this Palm Sunday. And, and soon we're going to be doing a song about it, Father God. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. You are King of kings. You are Lord of lords, Father God. And we thank you for being that for us. We thank you for the day that you got on that cross. Nobody put you there. You did it willingly, Father. You knew it would hurt. You knew the pain. You were 100% human and 100% God. But you did it because you love us, Father God. No greater love has there ever been in this world and never will be. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise and honor and glory. Amen. You may be seated in his presence. This morning I'm looking around to see if uh, who I got in the doghouse this morning has arrived, and they're not they're not here. Um, so there would be times I'd come home from work and I'd be pretty tired, I'd be pretty exhausted, I'd be pretty moody, I'd be pretty frustrated, I'd be pretty cranky. But whenever I opened that door and walked into my house, there was my dog. His tail's wagging, his eyes big as a baseball. He's just one, running up to me, running in circles. He's so excited. He just wants to love on me, and then. I'd go to sleep for a little while. <laughs> then I'd wake up. I'd have bad breath. My hair would be all a mess. Guess who's right there? There's my dog. My dog just wanting to love on me. My dog just licking my face, jumping up and down. And then I'd put on an ugly old robe and untied shoes. And I'd walk down to the mailbox. And there's my dog just jumping up on me, running in circles, so excited to see me. And it hit me. The Lord spoke like a ton of bricks just hit me inside the head. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we had a church like that? A church that just dogged you. church just loved you. Didn't matter if you had bad breath and hair was messed up. Didn't even matter what kind of mood you were in. We're just going to pray for you. We're just going to keep loving on you. We're just going to keep dogging you. And so we started dogging some people in the church. We started praying for them, upholding them. And that's what we're doing right now. We're going to pray for our dear brother, Bob McGinnis. Mm. That's, there's a good picture of him, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's Bob. That's Bob. <clears throat> Bob, I love you. And if you're watching, if you ever see this, you know, there are times when I can be a little bit cranky. I admit it. There are a little bit times when I can be a little bit stubborn. I, I admit it. And those times, I pray that you might forgive me. Now, if you know Bob, there are times when he can be a little bit cranky. He can be a little bit stubborn. He can be a little bit, and Bob, we're just going to keep loving on you. We're just going to keep dogging them. We're just going to keep upholding you before the Lord. Are you with me, church? Yeah. yeah. Let's pray for Bob McGinnis. Father in heaven, I just want to come before you and pray for my dear brother. Father, he's endured many, many trials and tribulations in his life, Father, and lots of questions, lots of concerns, lots of anger, lots of bitterness, lots of faith. He keeps showing up, Father. He keeps seeking you. And Father, I pray. That as we uphold him, as our dear brother in Christ, Father, that you work within his life. That you touch his mind and touch his heart. That you challenge him, that you change him, that you mold him. Father, that you enlighten him about the love that you have for him. And Father, I pray that he recognizes the family that is around him. That loves him and dogs on him and prays for him and upholds him. Father, we come before you with thanksgiving and praise. In the name that is above all names, the sweetest name of all, Emmanuel, Yeshua, the Messiah, the Christ, in his name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so I have also a uh, couple notes. I got a phone call this morning from Joe Vidal. If you don't, you should probably know who Joe Vidal is, one of your deacons as well. He's in the hospital. 
has eternal bleeding, been through a couple blood transfusions, just another brother in Christ that we're upholding. Matthew, been in the hospital for several weeks awaiting surgery, uh, just had surgery recently, I think this past Friday, still recovering. So, you know, there's, there's lots of people to always continue to pray for, right? I give you the scriptures every week that I'm going to be preaching on in the week to come. Please read the scripture, pray over that, pray for me that, that God brings the message that's re relevant to you and to each and every one of us. You with me? And of course, my wife hands me a note and says, hey, don't forget this, this. You always got to remember that, right? That Easter next week, we're going to have an Easter breakfast around 9 o'clock, okay? So there's no Sunday school, but you're more than welcome to come. Please bring something to share if you like, and we'll hang out. There's lots of other stuff going on for kids and Easter egg hunts and all that kind of stuff as well. Stone Castle Band, thank you for being here this week. Appreciate each and every one of you so much. And uh, hey, maybe, maybe, maybe you want to say it with me. Hey, check this out.
Good to have a special. We so appreciate our youth and our young adults. And we had some children, but apparently something's going around. So we don't have them. Praise God. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Because I know I can't stop praising he who sits. Praising His name, I 
sits on the throne. Teach us today, O oh Lord.
go through any religious leaders. We love our pastor, but we know that we don't have to go through him to get to you. We go directly to you through Jesus Christ because that veil was torn. Oh, 
Let's see if it'll open up here. Do I love the Bible app? How do I answer that right now? I don't know if my mic's on at the moment. <laughs> oh, it's about to die. Um, all righty. Whee! That's not what it's like. Starting verses 1 through 11. Where is the handheld? 1 through 11? As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. May God bless the reading of his word. May God bless the reading of his word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, All right. <laughs> I don't know, if we don't get this thing on, I might have to use that microphone there. Check, check, one, two, check, check, one, two. Are we working, not working? Is this thing on? I'm just going to use, okay, I was going to use this one. Now this one's not working either. Check, one, two, check. Woo! It's not like I needed it anyway. So today we're going over Palm Sunday. Why? Because it is Palm Sunday, right? Right? So today is Palm Sunday. It is a Sunday that falls before Easter. We are commemorating the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. During that time, palm branches were placed in his path before his arrest on Maundy Thursday or Holy Thursday and his crucifixion on Good Friday. This event thus marked the beginning of the Holy Week, the final week of Lent, according to our Christian calendar. And this is the time also to set aside time for soul searching, prayer, fasting, and all in all drawing near to God. Now Palm Sunday is recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, and John 12. So it's a very important event, is it not? And many Christian denominations worship services on Palm Sunday include a procession of the faithful carrying palms, which represent the palm branches that the crowd scattered in front of Jesus as he rode in Jerusalem that day. In ancient Christianity, palm branches symbolized goodness and victory. The goodness of our Lord in spite of our sins and the victory that he gave us over sin and death through his sacrifice at the cross. These palm branches were often depicted on coins and important buildings. Jody, if you could switch to the next slide. There's a coin up there, an ancient Hebrew coin, as well as a building with a palm tree on it, palm branch, palm tree. And Solomon had palm branches carved into the walls and the doors of his magnificent temple as a symbol of beauty and elegance. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 29. On the walls all around the temple and both the inner and outer rooms, he carved cherubim 
palm trees, and open flowers. At the last book of the Bible, we read that people from every nation raise palm branches to honor Jesus. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. That is what we'll be doing in heaven. We'll be wearing white robes and waving palm branches before the Lamb. People from every tribe, every language. It's a sign of their unity and never-ending praises to the Lamb for his great love towards us. It is always, always a Palm Sunday in heaven. If you go to the next slide there, Jody, in the Roman Catholic Church, Palm Sunday is commemorated by a solemn procession of the clergy, the acolytes, the parish choir, and then followed by the entire congregation. The Mass is focused on the blessings of the palms by the priests, which are saved in many churches to be burned and used in Ash Wednesday services the following year. The Catholic Church considers the blessed palms to be a sacred sacrament. The clothes for the day are deep scarlet red, the color of blood, indicating the supreme redemptive sacrifice of Christ at the cross. As Christ entered the city of Jerusalem, it was to fulfill the passion and the resurrection for our forgiveness and redemption. In many Protestant churches, children are given palms and then walk in procession around the vicinity of the church while the adults watch and remain seated. Palm Sunday is a joyous occasion in the Philippines, as you see in my next slide here. Communities reenact Jesus' triumphant entry with a procession. There's a procession of a statue of Christ seated on a donkey, which we call the humenta, with the officiating priest on horseback around or towards the local church as the faithful believers wave palm branches or palaspas. In some towns, elderly women spread heirloom toppies or aprons made for this special purpose or large cloths along the route, ideally to be treaded upon by the statue or the priest. Children dressed as angels sometimes sing Hosanna, while throwing flowers all around as they pass by. Once the palm branches were blessed by the priest, they are brought home by the believers and placed on their altars, or hung beside or above the doorways and windows of their home. The significance of Palm Sunday, particularly the waving of the palm branches, must never be forgotten. It is to remember the triumphant entry of Christ the King in Jerusalem. It was a significant event, not only to the people of Jesus' day, but to Christians throughout history. We celebrate Palm Sunday to remember that momentous occasion. On that day, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a borrowed donkey's colt, one that had not been ridden before. The disciples spread their cloaks on the donkey for Jesus to sit, and the multitudes came out to welcome him, laying before him their cloaks and branches of palm trees. The people hailed and praised him as the king who comes in the name of the Lord as he rode to the temple where he taught the people, healed them, and drove out the money changers and merchants who made his father's house a den of robbers. The real purpose of Jesus riding into Jerusalem was to make public his claim to be their Messiah and king of Israel in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. His ministry is no longer private, but made known to everyone. Before that, he tells his disciples to be quiet about him. But now he wanted them to shout his praise and worship him openly for all the world to hear. It was a big change of his ministry strategy the people responded by spreading their cloaks as an act of homage fit for a king. Palm Sunday, therefore, was when Jesus was openly declaring to the people that he was their king and the Messiah that they had been waiting for. And the book of Matthew says that the king coming on the foal of a donkey 
was an exact fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion! Shout, daughter of Jerusalem! See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus was riding into his capital city as a conquering king and is hailed by the people with enthusiasm and humble submission. The streets of Jerusalem, the royal city, were open to him that day. And like a king, he ascended to his palace, not a temporal place, but a spiritual place, ushering in a spiritual kingdom that is eternal in the heavens. And that spiritual kingdom that has been inaugurated that day has, ex has been extended to us in this very moment. Therefore, he deserves the worship and praise of his people because he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. However, the praise that the people lavished on Jesus did not last long, did it? They failed to recognize him as their savior from their sins. They welcomed him out of their desire for a messianic deliverer or a military leader to lead them in revolt against Rome. There were too many people during that time who, though did not believe in Christ as Savior, nevertheless hoped that perhaps he would be to them a great temporal, temporary deliverer. These are the ones who hailed him as king with their many hosannas, recognizing him as the son of David who came in the name of the Lord. But when he failed in their expectations, when he refused to lead them in a massive revolt against the Roman occupiers, the crowds quickly turned against him. Within just a few days, their hosannas would change the cries of, Crucify him! Those who hailed him as a hero would soon reject and abandon him. This, this church is how the human heart acts. It is deceitful among all things. Man is sinful in the heart and very deceptive. Transformation, therefore, should happen from within the heart, within the hearts of men, not just in the society we live in, the culture we live in. It should happen from within, transformed from within. When we're reborn, we're regenerated with a new heart with Christ inside. Even if you change the form of government, if the people are corrupt from within, will there be any change at all? It would just be cosmetic. It would be a cosmetic type of change. But the Lord wants to give us a new heart and mind that could not would, not should, that could obey his will. Praise God that on that Palm Sunday, Jesus taught us the greatest change should come from the heart. We have learned to love others because he first loved us on the cross. That is why the first word Christ declared on the cross was, Father, Abba, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. And so today, church, we're going to study the triumphant entry of Christ on Jerusalem. What are the lessons he wants to teach us? And how can he reign and triumph within us? Next slide there, Jody. Number one, Palm Sunday reminds us of God's plan of redemption. Matthew 21, verses 1 and 2, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. Now let us look closely at what's going on here. This incident happened on the last week of the Lord's earthly life when he made an appearance in Jerusalem as the Messiah and consequently suffered the penalty of death. They arrived at the place called Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. And that word Bethphage means house of figs, 
probably because of the many figs that were growing there at that time. Here it is, Bethphage, and that place that he points to is also called Bethany, which was below the summit, somewhat further from the city, but within the bounds of Jerusalem. It was there that Jesus sent his two disciples. Maybe one of them was Peter. Some scholars would like to say they're Peter, but their names were not given here. It was as if Christ had already made previous preparations for what was about to transpire in this public presentation of his ministry. It was planned, even to the minute detail. It was quite contrary to Christ's usual habits. Now notice the minute details that Jesus gave to his two disciples on where they had to go. He gave them details on where they had to go, what they will find there, and what they will do with it right away. And he spoke with authority, and he demanded obedience. Every minute detail has been properly planned and thought of. It's not just a spur-of-the-moment decision. It's not just a, an instant decision, just like most of us make sometimes. It was a deliberate, premeditated, and meticulously planned event in the ministry of Christ. The salvation and redemption of humanity has been in his plan since before creation. In the same manner, God has a great plan for our salvation. He knows that we have no ability on our own to go to him because of our sins. Our relationship with God has been blocked. There's a dividing wall that separates us from and that is why God's plan has been revealed publicly on that Palm Sunday. God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, 100% God, 100% man, so that by his suffering and death, we might have life and that life abundantly. We must therefore submit to his plan and appropriate his plan of salvation for all of us. And there are many people who have not yet heard of God's great plan of salvation. From your neighbor, to your coworker, to the people that are around you constantly, day to day, your enemy. We must share this great plan to everyone. Everyone, whether you think they deserve it or not, because let me tell you something, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. What then is his plan for our salvation? See, here's the problem. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, We are separated from God, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. See, God is holy, but we are sinful. Because of this, there is a big gap that separates us from God. That word separate means we've been disconnected or set apart from God's presence. We cannot, his, we cannot enjoy his fellowship and no amount of good works which amount to filthy rags from our part can bridge the gap of separation. This is a big dilemma we are all facing. But here's the solution. God doesn't just leave us hanging there. What is the solution, folks? Do you guys know what the solution is? Christ. Oh, man, guys, come on. The solution is Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There you go. God reached out to us through his son, Jesus Christ. His death on the cross was a demonstration of his great love in spite of our sinfulness. He was the substitutionary sacrifice, the substitutionary atonement. He took our pain. He took what we deserved, even though he had done no sin. God has provided the solution. God has provided a way for our salvation. And there is no other way to be saved but through Christ. Amen? There is no other way to be saved. You can't be saved by the Buddha, by the polytheistic Hindu gods. You can't be saved by the seven pillars of Islam. The only solution, the only way to solve this problem, the only way to be saved is by who? Christ. Through Christ. Now what do we do in this? 
What must we do? What are we instructed to do? Repent and believe. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Now that the, the way has been made clear for us to take, we must repent from our sins and believe in the Lord Jesus. Repentance requires sincerity of the heart, in the heart of a person who wants to turn away from the corruption of sin. To repent means to literally turn away from it. Not to flirt with it, not to fall into temptation of it, but to turn away from that sin. It requires a voluntary change of heart through the grace of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the believer. Through repentance, a person experiences a personal renewal and inward transformation. And if you haven't received God's Son yet, I urge you, receive God's Son. Receive this gift that he has given you, this free gift of salvation. John chapter 1, verse 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This repentance is accompanied by receiving Christ to dwell in the heart of a person. This then is the new birth experience when he receives the inheritance of becoming a child of God. No longer enemies, no longer separated, but he has been adopted into God's family forever. This is the plan of salvation that Christ initiated for the redemption of mankind from the very, very beginning from before the beginning that is why we go further on we can notice that why if we go further on we can notice that jesus told his disciples that in that village they'll find a donkey tied there some bible scholars believe that this donkey or ass represents the jewish people which had long borne the yoke of the law for many years the donkey should be loosed and brought to the lord it was as if the Jewish people were loosed from the slavery of sin and brought to the Lord through Christ as their Messiah. But not only the Jewish people get this gift, but the gift of eternal life has been extended to all of humanity as well. Amen. Praise God, we have been set free from the slavery and the condemnation of sin. Now this is ultimately better than the overthrow of the Roman Empire, is it not? It's way better than overthrowing the Roman Empire that those people there in that moment were expecting Jesus to do. Next slide. Palm Sunday reminds us that Jesus is our king. Jesus is our king. Matthew 21, verse 3. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now, there might have been a possibility that the disciples will encounter some opposition along the way. And then Jesus instructed his disciples on how to overcome it by saying the right word. They should explain that it was the Lord who needed it. That word Lord is equivalent to Jehovah or King or the Messiah. That means that the owner of the animal might also be a disciple who acknowledges the claims of Christ. That simple announcement that the donkey was needed for God's service would silence all refusal. Indeed, Christ is, after all, the real owner of all they possess. And Christ is the real owner of all we possess. He is the creator of us all who existed from the very beginning. And so the disciples must act at once and execute the orders of Jesus as of great importance, as of greatest importance. And that is why Palm Sunday reminds us that Christ is our king. He reigns over us all and deserves our full allegiance this world system and earthly kingdom does not recognize Christ as king. They despise him. They reject him. And that is why his kingdom is not of this world. That is why, and we are therefore not citizens of this world. We're citizens of his eternal kingdom and heaven. 
But what does it mean for Christ to be our king? Let's dig a little deeper. Let's peel the onion a little bit more. What does it mean for Christ to be our king? Next slide there, Jody. One, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Imagine the presidents or leaders of the world governments have a timetable for their stay in power. Our president here in the United States is limited to only four years per term. If he's elected for another term, he gets another four years. And after that, he has to vacate his office for another person to take over leadership. But Christ is the ruler of all the earth. For all time. He had been there in power even before we were born and will continue to be in power after we all die. He had been, faith, he had been a faithful witness of changes in government in various countries, but he is the one who rules over all. Next slide. He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Revelations chapter 17, verse 14. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of Lords and king of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. This Palm Sunday, we have to be reminded also that he is the king of kings, the king of all the kings of this earth. Even if they don't presently recognize him as king and wage war against God, but someday they will all be defeated. And will all bow down and give their respect to him. Number three, he is the mighty and awesome God. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Look at the description regarding Christ as our king. He shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Shows no partiality. What does that mean? That means that Christ has no favoritism, no special inclination to support one party over another. There's no Republican or Democrat. All are equal before his sight. And the words accepts no bribes means that he does not need any bribes because he already owns everything. <laughs> therefore, therefore, he cannot be corrupted with evil. There's no human leader who could equal to that. Name me one. I thought so. Number four, he's the blessed and only ruler. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, which God will bring about in his own time, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so we have to be reminded that only Christ is king. Christ is king of all the earth. Let us examine what the scripture says further of Christ in Matthew 21, verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. That word fulfill means all the words of the prophecies has been accomplished or brought to completion in Christ that day. What the prophets foretold had been a reality in Christ. The disciples, however, did not know at that time that they were fulfilling prophecy or having any such purpose in mind. They were just, get this, this only happens every so often. They were just obedient to Christ. They were just obeying his command. But the knowledge of this revelation came afterwards by the power of the Holy Spirit of wisdom when they reflected after that incident, after Jesus had ascended into heaven. Matthew 21, verse 5. Say to daughter Zion, see your king, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
That daughter of Zion refers to Jerusalem and its inhabitants, named from the chief of the hills on which the city was built. The word see or behold refers to the unexpected or suddenness of the event whereby the king is made known. That king is the one who is foretold by the prophets who is to occupy the throne of David and will reign for all eternity. But it is said that the king will not come with pomp or warlike greatness, but with meek and lowly in heart. Remember in Matthew 5, Jesus writes in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, the meek, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What is being meek? It's not weakness. Humble. It's power under control. Strength under control. Meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. His goal is to save the people from their sin, not from the military ruler. That is why many people that day miss the truth. And they miss that truth. And I pray to God that you will not miss this great truth. Because this was the only way to deliver the people from the cycle of sin. If the deliverer will be in terms of military victory over their enemy, the result will be short-lived. Because sin, which is the real problem, will never be vanquished in the hearts of the people. And then after, if he were to be a military ruler or a military ruler were to, let's say, show up and conquer over Rome, the cycle of sin would happen still. The cycle of sin, oppression, repentance, deliverance, peace, but then sin, again, will keep on going. I don't know if many of you guys have read the Old Testament, but that's a lot of what the Old Testament is about. It's very cyclical. The Hebrew people come to God, they praise God in his praises, and he blesses them and shows them favor. But then, as generations keep going, they fall, and they go start worshiping other gods, start marrying people of other lands and bringing their gods into, into the land of Israel, and then they get, fall. And then God needs to send a, another deliverer to save them, and then the cycle happens again. But Jesus prevents that cycle. The reason why Christ came is to destroy the works of the devil. This then is the eternal kingdom that Christ established in the hearts of men as distinct from the kingdoms of this world. And then look at what the disciples did in Matthew 21, verse 6. This is very rare. This only happens every once in a while. It says, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. That didn't happen very often. But when they did, amazing things took place. Those words, went and did, are wonderful words of obedience to Christ, which we need to apply. They simply obeyed the order, not yet knowing the impact they are doing for future generations ahead. And this is what Christ desires from all of us. Obedience. And obedience should come from our heart. We obey because we love him. We obey because we adore him. We obey because he deserves our loyalty, does he not? Obedience, therefore, is the duty of every believer in Christ. Once we recognize him as king, our action is complete obedience and submission to his lordship. So next slide there, Jody. First, Palm Sunday reminds us that God has a great plan for our redemption. Second, Palm Sunday reminds us that Christ is the king of kings. Lord of Lords. Third, Palm Sunday reminds us that we have to receive him with humble enthusiasm. I'll get to that. 
Matthew chapter 21, verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Now notice what the disciples did in obedience to Christ's command here. They stripped off their heavy outer garments and put them as trappings on the two beasts, the donkey and the colt, not knowing on which their master meant to ride. It was an expression of their humble submission to the Lord's plan. It was also a sign of respect and paying homage to their king. And it does not matter that it was their simple clothes given to Jesus and not the best garments from Egypt. It does not matter that it was only a colt or a donkey that Jesus was riding upon that Palm Sunday and not the most expensive and bulletproof limousines that the leaders of our governments also use or also use. Whatever. Christ is satisfied with the cloaks given by the love of his disciples. What Christ is looking for is the heart of obedience from his subjects. And that is the kind of heart that God wants to see from each and every single one of us. Pure, committed, dedicated, and sincere. Not manipulative, not deceptive, but pure, committed, dedicated, and sincere. And because of that, the entire crowds followed as well as to give their respect to Jesus, the king. Matthew 21, verse 8, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. They saw what the disciples did, and they were motivated to do the same. They spread their garments as well on the road, fired with enthusiasm and excitement. And this crowd was probably composed of pilgrims who were coming to the festival at Jerusalem that day. The energy was electrifying. They voluntarily wanted to make a, a red carpet, so you say, over which the Savior would pass. It was an honor that was often given to great men as if arriving from a great conquest. And it is an honor that we need to give to Christ as well. With that, there was a unison of worship to Christ from the crowd. Matthew 21, verse 9. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. You could feel the excitement among the crowd as they went ahead of Jesus and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the highest heaven. Probably because they could still remember that the same Jesus was the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. When they heard that he was in the neighborhood, they wanted to meet him and give him honor. That word Hosanna is compounded of two words meaning save and now. It was originally a formula of prayer and supplication, but later became a term of joy and congratulation and so when hear the words hosanna to the son of david means jehovah bless on the son of david and it became the first christian hymn that was given to palm sunday the same thought is given in psalm chapter 118 verse 26 blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord from the house of the lord we bless you it means blessings on him who comes with divine mission sent with the authority of Jehovah. And in the same manner, we, when we come to fulfill our mission on earth, we have the full blessing of God, Jehovah, with us. And when we bless others, we cry to God to ratify in heaven the blessing which we invoke on earth. It again asserts the claims of Christ as the Messiah. No wonder Christ was received with great enthusiasm. Matthew 21, verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? It is interesting to note that the whole city was stirred when Jesus entered Jerusalem. Do you guys remember the first time the city of Jerusalem, entire Jerusalem, was also stirred? Was troubled? The first time was when the wise men walked through the street inquiring, where is he that is born king of the Jews? But during this time, the excitement is far greater and more general in aspect. The Romans probably expected some public uprising that might come. The Pharisees were stirred to new envy and malice over the popularity of Jesus. And the entire population probably was looking forward to the idea that there is hope ahead. 
this Messiah might lead them into victory over the Romans. But many are still asking, who is this? Who is this? And they still don't know who this Messiah is and what was his purpose for coming. And so let me ask you this question. Do you know him? Do you know him? Is he your Lord and your Savior? Do you know the true purpose of his coming? Do you know the true purpose? Listen to the conclusion of the crowd in Matthew 21, 11. The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. See, the crowd gave his name, Jesus, his title, prophet, and his dwelling place, Nazareth, and they call him the prophet probably because he has been commissioned by God. They told about his earthly dwelling place in Nazareth, but they did not declare Christ was their king and the awaited Messiah. No wonder their enthusiasm was being dampened. And one week after, just one week, the same crowd raise their voices to crucify him. They miss the point. We must learn from their mistake. We must develop the attitude of praise in our lives, not just for a moment, but for all eternity. Now I'm going to ask you this last question. Is he your king? If you guys haven't seen yet, there are crosses back there. Feel free to take one. Take them as you please. Now, if you'd rise with me. This is the ironic benediction. Not ironic, ironic benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face shine down upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go serve your God.